From the newest developments in realty and construction to the hottest trends in design lifestyle. We bring you the top thought leaders, most trusted brands, and the most exciting projects in the industry. To guide you in acquiring, building, and living in your home wherever it may be. I'm Jules Cruz. I'm John Aguilar. And I'm Isa Litton. Come home to Realty TV Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Realty TV Podcast. Real estate investments are definitely exciting, but it takes a certain finesse to get it right and make the most out of it. Realty TV Podcast is here to guide you through, bringing you the hottest real estate trends, newest developments, and most trusted thought leaders to pave your path to real estate success. This is a spin-off show of Philippine Realty TV, the first real estate and construction TV show in the country, airing since 2008 and now on its 18th season. Philippine Realty TV is the top of mind television medium for anything related to the real estate and construction industries. And now we welcome you to its new podcast form. Realty TV podcast will present more in-depth discussions and features on everything real estate. Realty TV podcast is available everywhere you listen to your podcast and also has video versions on YouTube and Facebook. Greetings to our listeners from the Philippines, Asia, and beyond. Joining us on the podcast today is Professor Eric Soriano. So Prof. Eric is a former World Bank IFC governance consultant, columnist, book author, former chair of the marketing cluster, program director for real estate and professor of global marketing at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business. Professor Soriano is currently the executive director of the Wong Bernstein Group, an Asia Pacific based strategic advisory firm that specializes on family governance and next generation leadership. Presently, he sits in the board as independent director of Resorts World Manila and Emperador Distillers. Everyone, the one and only Professor Eric Soriano. Hello, Professor Eric. Hi, hi, John. Hi, John. Good to be here. And thank you for this invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Eric, for joining us here. Our next guest on the podcast is Texa Maniego. Texa Maniego is the head of the Special Projects and Supplements team of Philippine Daily Inquirer. She has been with Inquirer since 2000 and began her writing career as a contributor for several sections including science and health, property, and business. Since her appointments as property editor back in 2016, Tech has introduced new themes, columns, and creative executions to provide more interesting and more comprehensive content for the section. Everyone, please help me welcome Tech Samaniego. Hello, Tech. Hi, John. Good afternoon. And hi, Prof. Eric. Thank you again for inviting Inquire Property to be a part of this podcast. Okay. Professor Eric Tech, thank you very much for joining us here in Realty TV Podcast. So the Inquire Property section is the media partner of Realty TV Podcast. And we're very happy and privileged to have as a partner, um, I guess what I would call the voice of the print medium of real estate and construction here in the Philippines. Tech, you've always been, um, I guess for me at least, top of mind when it comes to me finding out what is currently happening in the real estate ecosystem here in the Philippines. I've always been a fan of this section and with your leadership, I found that through the years, it's actually taken a very unique identity of its own because if you look at the section, it seems to go against the trend of, you know, we see a lot of um, real estate sections actually losing steam. But in your case, I think it's the other way around. I think realty or the property section has actually picked up for the inquirer group of companies. Um, what would you say, Tech, is the secret um, to, I guess, the, the robust performance of inquirer property? John, first of all, thank you for that. I, I, I think ever since we 
became the section editor of the property section and I was joined by Amy is also a business ed, uh, business reporter before she joined the property section. It has always been about innovation. It has always been about making sure of going beyond the standards and ensuring that we provide up-to-date um, information and going beyond just the mere structures, but really moving into in-depth reporting when it comes to property news. So I think that's basically one of the reasons. And also, partly because of the, I think, strong relationship that we have with uh, developers and other stakeholders involved in the industry. So for us, it's more than just reporting about the latest project or the latest endeavor of a particular developer. It's always been about ensuring that there is a healthy mix of uh, news about property developers, about home buyers, and the other, uh, as mentioned, other stakeholders already involved in this sector. Yes, and speaking of stakeholders, Professor Eric, you've always been, um, I guess, uh, I would say at the trenches of real estate here in the Philippines, hand in hand in most cases with uh, a lot of the country's top developers. You've seen it all and you've gone through so many cycles of the property sector, uh, advising some of the biggest companies here in our country in terms of their growth or sometimes also in times of the times when they would need a turnaround. Um, what would you say, Prof, is a, a very apt description of where the property market is at this specific moment in time, fourth quarter 2020, neck deep in this pandemic? Oh, uh, thank you, John. That's a, it's a tough question. Uh, I guess a, a, an appropriate term here is... Uh, uh, if a developer mindset of what if you build they will come, uh, that's not going to happen anymore, right? I, I think if I will probably use a term, you, you need to be very compelling now. Uh, the challenge is to 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 think and dive deep into a lot of things you now from innovation, from from retaining uh, customers to to having professional managers and even rationalizing and managing your resources. So, so the, if you build, they will come thing, uh, that's not going to happen. And therefore it's, it's important for developers, not just in the Philippines, but in Asia to really do more than what is expected of them. So, so I guess that's, that's where we're headed because this is a global trend that just simply got dumped into the property sector eight months ago. And it's up to us now how we can wiggle our way and be highly competitive. Prof, it seems only a couple of decades ago that you build it and they will come was the only strategy for most developers who were starting out the not so sophisticated property yes. market that we had. There were only a few players and these players were doing it for, I would say, um, one or two generations already, not really something that has been um, going on for a long time. But now things are very different. You get now the second, sometimes third generation of property developers creating very exciting projects. And these projects tech are some of the projects also that you as Inquirer Property have followed through the years with the numerous stories that you've developed, uh, the coverage and also the I guess the, the partnerships that you've had with these developers. Tech, what would you feel um, is something that the developers now are leaning towards? Now is a very interesting time. It, it's quite difficult, but there's also been a lot of talk of the property sector being more robust than we had originally um, predicted uh, as a result of this pandemic. What is your feel and what has been I guess the inside talk, if you can share with us on um, on the sentiment generally of the developers right now. Well, John, I think the, the main challenge here for, for most developers is that buyers have become even more, should I say, I'm not sure if it's the right term is demanding, but they have become even more intelligent when it comes to their investment. So it's for them, it's not enough that you provide them with um, a pool amenity or a gym. It all goes beyond that now. So I think for developers, it's really about who can immediately react or um, who can really up 
the ante when it comes to delivering the best service, the best developments, the most integrated development, and the one that can offer most value. So it, it's not just um, brochures will not be will not be enough. Okay, uh, videos, three hundred sixty degree videos of their showrooms will not be enough. It's really who can offer the most value in terms of pricing, in terms of innovations, and in terms of customer service. So I think these are the three factors that developers should really focus on. So for me, that's it, John. Yes, I think the, the, the old saying that you build it and they will come now is I think you have an idea of what can be built, but it's not enough that you build it. It's really doing also the nitty-gritty, the hard work of research and trying to also see what the market needs at any particular point in time. And we find that a lot of developers have done this extremely well. And sometimes to, I guess, a fault, if I may say, and, and I don't mean to say it that way, but there have been disappointments in the property sector um, to date that have caused a lot of grief for our Kababayans, um, both here and abroad. And Professor Eric, I'd like to get your opinion on, you know, you said earlier it was all about before building it and they will come. In the past, um, developers have built, they came, but in some cases, the projects fell short, right? In this case now, people, as Tech said, they are smarter, they are more sophisticated, they know what they want. How should developers now respond to this growing sophistication of the property market and how do you see the projects evolving in the future? Yes, uh, good, good insight uh, uh, from tech. And of course, it's a wonderful question, John. Uh, and the consumers are, are, are definitely tech savvy. You know? So therefore, uh, technological innovation and sustainability will be key drivers for value Yes, we see a lot of uh, what sustainability ratings for, for, for office commercial developments, but, but that, is, uh, that has been unheard of in the residential space uh, because only a very small percentage in that space are actually fixated on sustainability ratings. Now, it's no longer the issue of uh, you know, having the best view and maybe a very pleasant place to live. Uh, we all know for a fact that technology has uh, pretty much disrupted behavior and the uh, economics, right? So therefore, uh, at some point, maybe in the immediate future, uh, some real estate old fogies uh, will likely become obsolete. And this will now be, uh, we will be witnessing the rise of, 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 of great concepts now because of the disruption so so these are things that are definitely happening as we speak and 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 there will also be a lot of collaboration with with the government uh, uh clearly it's now a mix of real estate economics from the investing community from the from the authentic home buyer and the government so that uh, when when you put all of this ecosystem together you tend to mitigate all the risks when it is a collective effort and it becomes now economically viable also. Plus the urban landscape will be more decent and there will be less issues on, on the environment if, if this ecosystem will really collaborate. Prof. Eric, you mentioned the role of technology. What is your fearless forecast in terms of the kinds of technologies that will be implemented from, I guess, the purchase side all the way up until maybe building management um, and, and things that pretty much will make for a better quality of life, both for residential projects and also better quality of work or working environment for those in the office projects or commercial projects? Well, for, for one, uh, I, I'd probably start uh, on one very important element. It's a buyer's market out there. So if it's a buyer's market, uh, and, and just looking at uh, recently uh, 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 the stats at the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, for instance, online 
startup started with a thousand before COVID. Now it's ballooned to almost eight thousand. And what does this uh, impact on on the state of the property sector? You, you see problems now of malls, how they will be able to resuscitate when right. online frenzy is 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 now creating a lot of uh, transactions. Uh, Technology, uh, for instance, in building healthy homes. Uh, this lockdown obviously reinforced and cemented the need for, for a healthy home, whether we like it or not. Not just all about being secured, but also being safe. So, so we were looking at uh, a lot of things. Uh, there's one developer where uh, recently uh, they just simply came up with the concept of, of uh, dual keys, which is a concept where, yeah, you, you just simply incorporate uh, uh, essentially two units in, in one flat where you can now include an Asian culture of getting your folks, old folks, be part of, of, of the, the flat. So you're, you're actually near but you're far in terms of uh of of relationship but the barrier has been totally taken out because a retired uh, parent can actually stay with you but not necessarily stay with you right so so these are important things that uh, technology has created uh and technology on raw materials on say uh, those that you don't see like healthy paints healthy knobs healthy kitchens, tables that can, can eliminate some form of bacteria. We, we are seeing a lot of changes and this is so dramatic in just a period of a few months. Uh, and that's why we, we are so excited no, from, from being in the industry since, since the 80s, uh, where we became complacent, crisis after crisis. Now, uh, you, you just can't simply be a simple observer. If you want to survive, you have to do things uh, outside the box of that box that's outside. <laughs> so, so that's really the challenge. No? Uh, and and uh, even in, in the selling side, the ecosystem, the transaction, the need to rationalize expenses, should I inject uh, in-house, continue to have burning costs? Or should I get uh, a consolidated external group that will help us uh, sell more, but with minimal expenses instead, right? So, so we're back to the 80s during my time where there was practically no in-house, right? So, so this is now a confluence of so many things. And, and for me, this is finally a dream because we now see the developers who have been raking it in and then suddenly get disrupted. <laughs> now they are forced to get professionals who will think deeper, not just on the economic side, but on technology and a whole slew of other innovations. Right. I love also how uh, technology has democratized opportunity, uh, whereas before it was just really left for the big boys to play now the playground is wide open for any new entrant to enter with the right concept, perhaps even the right business model. It is very, very exciting to be in our industry right now, more so because of the disruption that we currently have. Because, you know, the bigger you are, that they say, the harder it is for you to change. And Absolutely. in this case, this really leaves a lot of opportunity for the small players mm. who are trying to make a dent in the property sector. And I feel that in this particular case, at least in the next couple of months or even years, this is the perfect opportunity for, let's say another Airbnb uh, to come in or another, it doesn't even have to be along those same lines in terms of a business model. Something outside the box of the box mm -hmm. is I think, as what you said, is something that we're going to be looking forward to. Now, all of that is made possible because um, the youth has spearheaded this uh, race to technology. Um, uh, in particular, the millennials and the Gen Z are very, very well known to embrace technology. They, in fact, have grown into it and not just adapted to it. They have grown to 
be comfortable. They have actually um, used this as their primary source of information. Now, tech, the property section started out in um, you know the physical uh, newspaper, right? The the Philippine Daily Inquirer newspaper. But now I understand you have different efforts that you have um, put out there that also now cater to the younger demographic, the, the Gen X, the Gen Z. Uh, and this is a very interesting evolution that I'd like to also um, uh, uh, ask you to share with us. What has been the evolution of the property section and what do we have to look forward to in terms of content, in terms of execution, in terms of platforms where we will see your content? For, for journalists like us, it's it's very important, John, uh, for us to be able to evolve, to evolve with the market, to evolve with the needs of the times. And I think that's what's good about the Inquirer. Um, specifically for us, before our main concentration was really on print, but with the onset of the pandemic, we have started to actually look into other platforms. So we have moved in into the Viber space. And then we also have what we call the Inquirer Mobile. But uh, all these measures are actually done to make sure that we are able to touch base uh, with all the market segments. I mean, print is still, print when it comes to the property pages is still very much alive because we still have that um, batch of readers who are quite loyal to the newspaper. Yes. But then- When you what, say tech, sorry, I, I hope you don't mind me cutting you off, but when you say leaders, so these leaders are, the CEOs, these are the founders, these are the patriarchs, matriarchs of these real estate development companies, correct? Yes, yes. We always make sure that we address the needs of our readers and of, uh, I mean, the inquiry loyalists. So when we felt that there has to be a presence in the online world, we immediately um, made sure that we will mobilize Facebook, Instagram, Viber, and even Inquire Mobile. Not really a website because we feel that is already too much, but what the people need are actually just bits and pieces that could actually provide them just, you know, little news about a particular event, about a particular development. So by making sure that we have that 360-degree platform, we are able to touch base with all of the Inquirer readers. And I must say that it's been quite good for us having that Inquirer digital newsstand, having Viber, having Facebook and other social media accounts. And of course, this new partnership with Philippine Realty TV that will allow us to actually um, reach an even bigger market. Also, um, I, I, I'm quite proud to say that I think Inquirer Property was one of the very first um, organization to actually hold a webinar uh, immediately after the lockdown. And I think one of the first uh, guests that we had was Prof. Eric because... <laughs> Just earlier this, this year, we've also mounted our own forum. It was the first forum and things were actually looking really, really great. And the, the projections were very good. And then this pandemic came. So what we did was we immediately launched this webinar where we invited the experts to actually provide not only the stakeholders, but also our readers a preview of what's to come. So I think it's always been innovation. That's always been the key word for us, innovation and you know, having a feel of what the market wants. Yeah, speaking of innovation, I think that's also what attracted us to partner with you because like you said, you started with print, but now you've evolved to cover so many other platforms to get your content out there. And this partnership with our TV show, Philippine Realty TV, and now also with Realty TV Podcast, we feel is a is a match made in heaven because I think content wise, I'm, I'm one of your avid fans in terms of content. Um, I've always said publicly before that I learned how to read um, by, by reading the Inquirer every day. I mean, even my wife knows this, that with the exception of the pandemic uh, or the lockdown, I was reading the Philippine Daily Inquirer for at least 30 minutes every day to get uh, my dose of news. So right now, I think this tradition of getting the news has evolved because now we find you in so many other platforms. And we're just also very excited with this partnership because we know that our content on Philippine Realty TV and the podcast gets to also be seen by your very loyal, uh, rabid followers from the past. And now your growing number of, of, of readers 
um, out there. And I'd also like to say, Tech, that uh, we're also very excited to involve you in the projects that we'll be doing. I know that this week we've invited you to our building project in Quezon City, the Project Smart Home 2.0, which you will visit. And I am very excited to show you around and see exactly how you will be covering this as a case study for how content gets out there into the world. So I'm very excited to have you there join us on the Project Site Tech. Thank you, John. I mean, see, Prof. Eric knows about it. We've, we've been very passionate when it comes to delivering news about real estate. For us, it, it's more than just actually reporting, but it's really about, um, you know, putting the, the main issues at the center of everything, addressing the needs, not just of the developers, but really more of the home buyers. Speaking of issues, one of the biggest right now is, is quite surprising because people have always assumed that a pandemic will cause for the property market to dive. And when I say dive, the entire market will take a dive, regardless of what kinds of projects. But we found and we've been getting feedback, particularly from certain developers who have projects, lot or house and lot projects outside of Metro Manila. They've actually been getting more than their fair share, not just of inquiries, but of actual sales right in the middle of the pandemic. Prof. Eric, what would explain this phenomenon? And is it something that you're surprised with or is something that can be totally expected considering that people are now maybe a little bit wary of being confined in smaller spaces that maybe condos um, would have as a limitation? Well, if you ask me that question four months ago, I would probably say uh, five months ago, I'd probably say the market is bleak. It, it was a... You know, people were shadow boxing starting from April, May, and June. So that question, if it was raised uh, many months ago, I would say the market is really down in the pits. Since uh, all predictions are saying if the worst is yet to come, and that worst hit us in the third quarter with a negative 16.5, and they said that it's even worse than the, uh, the Asian financial crisis. And numbers do not belie that. It's, it's a fact. But now that you've asked that question, it's not as bad as, it, as what we've expected it to be. And, and I'm going to say it loud and clear. Developers now, uh, yes, they feel the pinch, but there are also many developers, both vertical and horizontal, that have sustained their momentum. Including... Vertical. Even prof. vertical. Okay, okay. Even vertical. I was surprised. Yes, there are verticals that have uh, that dived, but there are some vertical players that have uh, continued a flat growth and are even bullish for next year. Of course, the horizontal, it goes without saying that they have been resilient from day one. No, no doubt about it. But, but generally speaking... I, I am obviously more optimistic now than what I was four or five months ago, that the markets are not as bad as it was predicted to be. Number two, that we appear to be very resilient as opposed to other Asian countries. And number three, the saving grace, going back to your original question to tech, are actually the millennials. That age group, have been wanting to buy real estate last year, but it takes them a right. year to make those decisions. Right. Right? They have money already, and they have been primed to buy. Then the crisis hit, but they have been studying the market for a year. I think that is the, the psychological makeup of the millennials. They're not impulsive buyers. They studied the market for a year, right. and they finally found an acceptable home, then finally COVID hit, but they went through with it because you know why? They're savvy. There are good prices out there, discounts. This is the best time to buy because globally, and I can speak for some clients of mine in Singapore, for instance, the millennials now have been the biggest uh, 
contributor for for housing in North America, in Singapore. So I'm not surprised that it's happening here now. That 30-something year old are actually the ones that have brought in that so-called saving grace. Saving grace because they also want to save themselves from i can imagine so many millennials out there being stuck with their families you can only <laughs> take uh, uh you know sometimes a few hours of each other's company <laughs> after after a while you're just going to go crazy and that goes yeah. for both and they're yeah. 30 years old and they've been planning to buy five years ago they got stuck with their parents they're still working maybe in the bpo they have money for payment of the down payment and they've been shopping for the longest time and markets are so affordable better terms wow this is the best time to actually consider buying real estate and then technology is coming in you, you have the best of both for all these millennials who would have thought the pandemic will lead to a buyer's market this is the best time to buy yeah, yeah. absolutely let me just add to what Prof said a while ago. I, I, I think basically it's because the, the market, especially the millennials, have actually fully realized the value of having that their own space. I mean, given that not, now everything has to be done from home, never has the, a space been more important or been more valuable. And then Prof was right. Add to that the good payment terms, the pricing scheme, um, and then the very low rates when it comes to, to loans. I think you have here three of the main drivers. That's why recovery was really good for, for most developers. And I agree with Prof. Four months ago, the forecast was very bleak. They right. were saying it will take a while, may, maybe a year or two before we could really fully recover. But looking at the market now, and I mean, I've been in talks with the other developers, even the luxury market is in actually enjoying a, a good number of sales. So I think it's a, a lot of factors, the millennials, the good pricing scheme, and the valuable offerings of the developers. Uh, I think we're on the road to, uh, uh, I mean, a much faster recovery. Okay. In terms of, and, and either one of you can answer this, in terms of people, let's say, offloading their current vertical investments because I would assume that there would be people out there who have established their lives that say for a number of years living in a condo and now wanting to transition to a house and lot. Do you have any data or information on people migrating to a new lifestyle because of COVID or is that offset also by the millennials or the younger generation. Now, what has been, I guess, the play in terms of the balance of both the vertical and horizontal projects, um, in your opinion, or based on your interviews with your clients and advertisers? Um, Prof, is it okay if I answer first? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, it, as you know, John, before the pandemic, the, the fringe areas has already been gaining much traction. So I think this is uh, this has just been sustained, given that the I mean the convenience and the 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 space that's being offered by the fringe areas. And then when you mentioned that there is a shift now to to horizontal, I think what really happened was that the millennials or the other investors or home buyers are actually willing to keep their condominiums but are now also looking to a second investment outside of the city where they can actually spend their weekends so i, I think that that's actually a very good combination and um add to that the developers are already moving outside the city bringing their expertise bringing their integrated mixed use estate developments that offer the comfort, convenience, safety, security of a typical urban development in a suburban setting, which I think is actually very, very beneficial for everyone. Yes, it's interesting that you took note of that because um, as you know, Tech, we've been building different concept homes on Philippine Realty TV. And in fact, next year, that's going to be the direction for another home that we will be building outside. And the concept for that is Project Second Home. And when I say second home, it could be a second home that you maybe live in in the weekends, but it could also be your second home after the first home 
that you've bought or maybe even built within, um, I guess, the urban area. So that's something that I'm very also excited to, to share with you and your readers. Eventually, when we do invite you to that next project in partnership with one of the country's top developers. So uh, we're really looking forward to sharing that um, with you as well. Um, Professor Eric, uh, now that we are in the topic of you know, the, the fringes, um, do you have a fearless forecast in terms of where we will be after this next, I would say, influx? Because, you know, um, the, the, the urban areas definitely have been, um, I would say, um, up to the brim in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, development. But now the fringes are catching up. And pretty soon, what is happening now in Metro Manila will happen to the fringes. And I'd like to find out from your perspective, what do we have to look forward to when the time that that time comes? Yes, uh, I, I, I go back to my, my doctorate years uh, at UP when I stumbled upon my research, uh, a term called the uh, rural, rural urban. And, and this is pretty much what's happening. There is absolutely no doubt that demand will rise in peripheral areas. And I can speak uh, based on first-hand experiences uh, where people will now try to migrate from congested city centers to peripheral areas with what? Bigger, larger open spaces, greener spaces, and still embrace the concept of what? Dedicated workstations, recreational space, right? Even having extra bedrooms and even converting clubhouses into workstations with uh, wonderful Wi-Fi connection. Because most of our, our clubhouses are, are, are practically unused. And this is the best time to push developers to make it very functional with a high utilization rate since it's being paid for anyway. So yes, definitely. Uh, and I talked to many. I actually polled many players. And yes, they're bracing for this migration. Uh, both horizontal and vertical. Now, it can be primary, it could be secondary homes, but I think it's, it's very clear this urban concept is definitely coming on stream. Kaya sabi ko lagi, uh, this crisis, this COVID, this pandemic is a great equalizer for the artisanal developers and the big boys. It now balances the equation. Right, because uh, you don't have to be big to to innovate. You can actually start small, and then from there grow it. And this is really a great equalizer for many boutique players. So so they should come in and, and join the fun because this is going to be an exciting 2021. Well, Prof. Eric, I think no doubt about it. It will be an exciting 2021. It has been a very exciting 2020. But I hope <laughs> the excitement is of a different um, kind because I feel also that the exciting projects that will be coming up will be also by the, the different players or the new players. And we've seen through the years, Prof. Eric, that the, the new entrants have been, I guess, not your traditional builders of the past. They maybe have uh, been in different industries. They have tried their hand now at real estate, maybe not knowing the rules. And, and that actually is something that's also helped them um, innovate and, and do things differently. And I feel that with your suggestions, I think um, it, it's very highly probable that the way work and the way life and the way living is done um, is going to take a completely different form. And, and what you just said right now about clubhouses being converted into, I guess, co-working spaces in a way is something that may be here sooner than later. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there to repurpose existing spaces. And I think this is one of the, I guess, safest and most, um, I guess, practical ways to, to be able to do that without you ever having to, 
um, leave the vicinity of your your place of residence. And I think that's a good way for vertical projects to also retain their um, occupants uh, is making the most of what you have and trying to make it as safe as possible for people to not think of having to relocate, right? So I think for for each player and for each category, there are ways to mitigate, um, I guess, the effects of, of COVID and how people will respond to, to this new normal. So, so yes, tech. Actually, John, if, if you think about it, this pandemic has to actually put to the test the developers, I mean, their capacity and their capabilities. In fact, the ones who actually made the mark are the ones who were actually quick to act and the one who could provide the most service, the one who could provide the best assistance to their residents. I think um, it also became somewhat uh, a good thing for home buyers and investors because now developers are up on their toes. They know that this is a make or break season for them. If they fail, they know that it, they will suffer. But if they are able to immediately address the current needs of their home buyers and investors, they know that they will benefit from it in the long run. That's one thing that's for sure. You know, with every tragedy or with every challenge, there always is a silver lining. And I truly believe that developers are very well poised to take advantage of the challenges that we will be facing. Because as, as Prof, you mentioned, people who are looking to uh, look outside the box of the box are the ones who will come up with the exciting uh, projects, developments of the future. And, and the future yeah. is as soon as maybe first quarter of next year, uh, would it be safe to say that we will be seeing some of these innovations as early as January of uh, 2021? I, I believe so. I, 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 they should. Otherwise, uh, right? They innovate or they die. So it, I think this is a wonderful platform uh, that, that, that both you and, and tech are really trying to institutionalize, to provoke these developers, to jolt them. That, uh, you know, when you talk about the economics, uh, you need to be human centric. It it fundamentally goes back to to humanity, right? Uh, and how how your your initiatives will be evolving on 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 a human centricity model. Balik pa rin sa dati. This is still fundamental. Eh. Kaya lang nakakalimutan ng nakakarami. And your your platform, your advocacy will push them, and hopefully provoke them that otherwise if they don't do it somebody else will right uh, speaking of humanity it brings me to um, a guest that we had on the podcast last week so last week just to give you a backgrounder i was able to visit um, our project site in marikina where we built a flood adaptive smart home we came up with in partnership with jason buen salido architect jason buen salido buen salido architects and the main premise behind this was to be able to create uh, a residential project that would be able to withstand the ravages of another Ondoy. So Ulysses brought another Ondoy type of um, flooding to Marikina. And I'm very happy to share with you that you know, we were able to succeed in, in making the car of that resident float. So we had a floatable carport that actually allowed their car to float. So their car, their sedan, was safe from the floods. Their neighbors, all of them, uh, their, their cars were submerged underwater, but theirs was safe. And that is just one part of what we did because one of the important things behind the concept for that project is that we built the house in such a way that the, the residential spaces were starting or started on the second floor. And the kitchen and the living area was on the third floor. So what happened is that when the floods came in, the resident of that project actually invited some of their neighbors to live with them when the floods were um, inundating the other houses in that area. So um, in, in a lot of ways, it prepared them for the flood. But Dr. Ted Esguera, who is a disaster management expert, um, shared with us that 
at the core of what we did and also at the core of what he would like for people to understand is that humanity plays a big part in the way we should develop our projects. Because come to think of it, no matter what amenity you have, um, bottom line is that preparedness that comes from making sure that you and your family uh, know the right procedures, know what to do in the event of a flood, preparing yourselves and not, um, I guess, relying on the local government, but knowing what to do, investing that time, that effort into making sure that you have the proper protocols in place. That is your investment into your family. And, and really, it stems from uh, wanting what's best for your family. And, and that's the kind of investment that he said is very important. And um, what eventually the, 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 the owners of um, that house that we built uh, was able to, to do. So I think that was, that was a case in point of that family investing not just in a flood adaptive home, but also in, I guess, the, the protocols to make sure that they would survive uh, a flood such as, in that case, Ulysses. Galing, galing. Nah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's good. Those are those are feel good. Those are hear good stories that uh, hopefully can be amplified because uh, we need that in 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 this in this crisis. Yes, and tech. Um, the past years when we came out with that project, um, the Inquirer was very instrumental in amplifying that message as well. In fact, after the story of that project came out. Um, back in 2014 when we start con started conceptualizing it. And by 2016, when we finished building it, we did receive a lot of feedback. And a lot of people who saw that also and read those articles um, eventually also adapted uh, the design principles from that project into their own home building project. So we have to thank you for that also, Tech, for helping us amplify um, that message to people who are li living in low-lying areas such as Marikina. You're welcome, John. And uh, as I've mentioned a while ago, we we are actually here to help deliver the good news. We are we serve as watchdogs to, you know, call the attention of those who are not doing their part. But we are also here to actually deliver the good news being done by our partners. So I, I agree with Prof. This year is a year of great reset. So I think really the challenge now is for for the developers to actually really do their do their share and go beyond just the practice of building homes, but really ensuring the safety, security, and comfort of, of our home buyers. It should go beyond just amenities, should go beyond just luxury units, but it's really of ensuring that every resident will really get their money's worth out of their investment. Right. And with that, I think that's a very optimistic view of what we can expect from the developers and also the other stakeholders who are part and parcel of the real estate and construction ecosystem that we have here in the Philippines. Because all of this is connected and real estate in particular is an industry where it just affects so many other industries and it really snowballs from um, this industry that we've grown to come to love. So with that, I'd like to um, ask uh, Professor Eric for your final words of advice, uh, any predictions that you would like to uh, now uh, use to close this, um, this uh, podcast uh, for people who are listening in and trying to get a feel of what the future uh, holds, um, I guess, for next year uh, for the Philippine property sector. I, I guess the, the key takeaway here is, uh, again, to, to challenge uh, the listeners and of course the developers uh, to, to, to start uh, rethinking, uh, like what Tech mentioned, resetting, rebooting, uh, reimagine uh, a new world, right? Uh, because there's really absolutely so much certainty now as opposed to five months ago. Uh, when I did mention uh, in, our, in, in the very first, uh, webinar that Inquirer organized, I did mention the only certainty is uh, uncertainty. Now, uh, it, it, it is coming into play. Uh, vaccine is just uh, probably months away. Hopefully. 
right? Uh, yes. so, so, so this is the best time to plan. This is the best time to, to brace yourself for that new rebooting because if you plan next year, it's going to be too late. That's why uh, the last two months I've been awash with so many planning sessions virtually purposely to compel players to really start thinking about the whole 2021 up to 2023. And when this event will finally subside and things will be okay, to come up with many scenario planning analysis and then time your value added, right? Concepts so that, you know, you surprise the market. And, but one thing is clear and fundamentally it should not be set aside. Your brand is critical. You cannot discount that. What I mentioned earlier about developers that uh, they perform well because they were a brand. Right. And number two, because they were so customer centric. They never forgot the concept of customer service. So all they have to do is to add another pillar, that innovation, that technology. Those that have not had any of those, they will have to dig deeper now. They still have a few months to really prepare because these are now the minimum, the baseline expectations of consumers who are now tech savvy and who are now out there for a vengeance. And if this happens and the recovery happens soon, Right, economists have said there's going to be revenge shopping. Oh, so I love that. that. Pent up Re demand. Hopefully, revenge shopping. They will be there, and they will be part of that share of mind and share of heart. So they have to be prepared now, not next year, because it might just be too late. Exciting times ahead when you think revenge shopping and when you think big ticket property. I mean, a house, a condo, uh, a lot is probably one of, if not the biggest investment that you can ever make in your life. And when you add that to pent up demand from a pandemic, uh, I can only imagine the kind of, I guess, sales <laughs> that, that mm. can happen once this is all over. Tech, how, how do you feel um, Inquirer and I guess your, your, your partners, the developers in the sector, what, what is your, your sense of how this will happen by next year? I think it, it's going to be a very exciting time for Inquirer Property as well. Um, I think that, that is in the horizon as well for you. So what is your take on that? And, and as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way to cap this, what can people expect also from you as the voice of, of the sector when it comes to property development? Uh, Jan, I've always been very optimistic when it comes to the sector. I mean, we have had many challenges in the past from the global financial crisis, Asian financial crisis, but we've always managed to pull through. And I, I think this one is no different. Exciting times ahead for the, for the sector for as long as the developers will do their part, will do their share, as long as they continue reinventing themselves, putting the best projects out there. Um, I, I mean, this pandemic has really put into focus the importance of having that safe space, of having that sanctuary, having a home. And I think it's something that most of our readers, the home buyers, the investors, have come to fully realize. So many of them have actually started window shopping, have actually started <laughs> to, you know, uh, saving up a little bit, inquiring here and there, looking out which projects could actually deliver the promise of a true comfortable living with or without the pandemic. I mean, the new yan, norm. Parang ako. <laughs> window shopping now. <laughs> window shopping, prof. I mean, now more than sure. ever is many, actually the best. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would always say this in every talk or webinar that I would attend. My up, uh, I would continue to appeal to our developer friends that they continue providing homes that that doesn't just provide um, value, but really one that could enhance the lifestyle of our home buyers. Because one thing is certain, the, the money that's being put into it is hard-earned money. 
So for me, that's my appeal. And then to the home buyers, please um, continue to work hard for your dream. Your home is your last refuge. As, as this pandemic has proven, there is no other place to go but I mean, but to go home. So I think now more than ever, we've all realized the value of actually investing in a decent home more than the travels, more than any other material thing. I think our homes actually play, played quite a very crucial role over the last six months na yata. For Inquire Property, um, we will be present in many platforms. We will be having many partnerships. Um, just during the pandemic, we've also had a partnership with the Department of Human Settlements with the DHSUD because we wanted to give um, first-hand information about what's been happening. And then this partnership with Phil Realty TV. So um, trust that we will continue to evolve. We will continue to be there for our developer friends and for other stakeholders, for the home buyers. We will continue to deliver the news. We will continue to be the watchdog. And um, of course, we will continue to evolve with the market. So again, John, I just want to, to, to thank you for inviting Inquirer Property. And of course, for people like Prof. Eric, who has been there for us since day one. I mean, um, from the time that we're just planning an actual forum down to the webinars. And he's always been very generous when it comes to being a resource person for our story. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. You can rely on Professor Eric for any economic turmoil, personal turmoil. Um, <laughs> he will be there. He will be. He will be one of the people who will help you get past your difficulty, whether it's a pandemic, an economic downturn. So thank you also, Professor Eric, for being that resource, being that friend, that advisor for a lot of the countries, not just developers, but families who are largely, I guess, to a certain extent, running this country. It's not an easy job to have that burden um, hoisted upon your shoulders, but we are very, very fortunate to have you. So thank you very much, Professor Eric. And thank Tech you. Samaniego of Inquirer Property, thank you very much for the partnership. Thank you very much for all you do. And we wish you luck as we continue to jointly help the property sector with our initiatives and also with the things that we will be sharing in our various platforms in the coming months and hopefully years. So thank you for that. And this has been another episode of Realty TV Podcast. I'm John Aguilar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.